good morning. It is, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Someone's excited to be here. It's not, it's not that cold. You know, I was watching the game last night, and I was thinking uh, the Chiefs and Dolphins football game, and I was thinking to myself, man, should we cancel church? It's going to be really cold. And I looked out, and there were like 60,000 fans outside of Arrowhead Stadium, negative seven-degree weather for three hours. I was just like, yo, <laughs> if, if they can do that to watch a football game, um, we can we can make it from our car into the building. And I said, you know, so we're going to keep having church. And so shout out to you guys that braved the, the cold and the storm to, to, to gather and to worship with us. Uh, if you have your Bibles, let's go to 1 John chapter 4. We are entering into a new sermon series on radical love. It is one of our core values as a church. When, when we planted Anchor Church, um, so we're going to be about three years here soon. We thought to ourselves, like, what do we want to be known by? Like, if, if somebody was to hear about Anchor Church, if they walked in through the doors, what would we want to be known by? And we, we want to be known for loving people. Like, like, we want to be known for our radical love for others and our radical love for God. Like, like you just feel loved, and, and you talk about it like, man, you go to Anchor Church, those people are going to love you. Like, it doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what you're in. It doesn't matter what's, what background you have. You show up to Anchor, and you are going to be loved. And and that's one of our core values. And so the title of my message today is Let God Love You. Let God Love You. And a a true Christian relationship is is a love relationship with God, right? We, we, We say, and you often hear this, love God, love people, and the first and greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and so that is kind of the foundational understanding of a Christian life is, is there's this love relationship. And, and you can always tell when people have a love relationship with someone because of the way that they talk about them, of the way that they engage with them, is the way that they show up to them, for them. And so when you see things like people outside of Arrowhead Stadium on negative seven degree weather, you're like, man, they love the Chiefs. Like they love the Chiefs. Like they love their football team. They paid thousands and thousands of dollars for to sit out there in the cold because they love how you relate to that talks about your love. And, and I think we have failed in this area, not as just Christian believers, but as people in our love for God. We just don't love God the way that we're supposed to. And, and as I read out of 1 John, just you can see how many times it talks about love here. And just in this short passage, 1 John 4, 7 to 12 says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Let me pray for us. Lord, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity and the blessing and the gift to gather in this way. Regardless of what it's like outside, Lord, you are in this room. And, and, and what a privilege and an honor to just gather with the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones to come around the table of your fellowship and to hear your word. Lord, I pray that as we dig into your scripture, that you would speak that your voice would be so clear to those who are listening, and that you just have your way in our hearts and in our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Over 30 times you'll hear John in 1 John 4 talk about love, 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 love. It's like this is, I don't want you to get tired of it, and it's not like it's building up to something. John, what he does is he just kind of gives us different perspectives of love, and he's walking around what love looks like, what love feels like, and that's a love relationship. But if you're one of those that take notes, my first point is this, love begins with God, and we see that in verse 8. It says, God is love. He, he is the antithesis of love. He is synonymous with love. God, it's his nature to love. Love begins with God. 
It does not begin with us. And so the command itself to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is flawed because we don't even have the capacity to do that. Like we just read that scripture and be like, yep, going to fail that one already. Why? Because love flows from God. And until you know him and you don't know love, and until you have him and you've received him, you just don't know love. Love begins with God. Supernatural love exists eternally in God. It finds its existence in him. It's his nature to love. Just like if you look at the sun and there's light that radiates from the sun, why? It's its nature to shine. The same as fire, heat radiates. It's its nature because that's fire. It's in its nature. And for God, love is his nature. He's synonymous. Like, I can't look at myself and be like, oh, David is love. Like, I can be kind. I can be loving. But I'm not synonymous with love. And so without God, you have not known love. There's a lot of counterfeit loves out there. There's a lot of experiences of of selfishness, of, of pleasure, of desire. But for us to get to the antithesis of love, it begins with him. It flows completely from God. And then it says, it implies that you and I are not loving. Because he says, that God had to send his only son to be the propitiation or the example or the sacrifice. So, so you and I, we've defiled God. We don't love God. We've, we're far from God. We don't know him as we ought to. And so therefore, God, being love, has to come show us what love looks like. Like we failed to love God, and, and we're not doing our part in loving him. So he can bring us back to that. We have not fully obeyed. We don't even have the ability to love God. In most loving relationships on earth, human relationships, things I love most, you find some level of loveliness in it. I was talking about first service, the first time I met my wife, and I saw her, and I was like, yo, she's fine. (laughs) You know, that's what I was thinking to myself. I was like, she looks good. There was something lovely about her when I saw her, right? It was an attraction, I didn't know anything else about her other than her beauty and her loveliness. And the more I got to know her, I got to see more of her beauty, more of her loveliness. And what made me really love her was when I found out she loved me. And and it was reciprocated, right? Like all of a sudden, you know, love is given back to love. And, And there's that relationship that grows. It's transactional because I love her because she loved me. And I love her because I found beauty and loveliness in her. But our relationship with God does not work like that. God did not look at us and see something lovely. God did not come and say, man, you guys are beautiful and you're loving and you're kind and I love you because of that. No, the opposite is true. Because God is love, he says, I want to love you. Because God is love, he says, I want to make you lovely. I want to make you beautiful. Because God is love, love begins with God. And so we can't even love God until we let him love us. There, we have no capacity to give anything back to God until he first loves us. So love begins with God. There is no greater sin in you than God's love for you. The Bible says that there's no height, nor depth, nor length, nor width that could ever separate you from the love of God. But sometimes we will go to conferences and we will go to events and we will hype ourselves up thinking, I'm going to love God. I'm going to do this. This is, on my, this is my ability, right? Like I've, I've went to the church camp and, and you get excited and you get pumped up on, man, I'm going to really run after God with everything that I have and I'm, and I'm going to do this. And you know what happens? That spiritual high, it lasts, what, two, three, four weeks? Why? Because love doesn't begin with you. And you can't work your way into loving God more. The only way we can love God more is to let him love us more. The only way we can grow in that, as soon as we put in our effort, man, we fail. We, we, we miss the mark. As soon as we think we're going to do this, we miss the mark. Because we think we can pull ourselves up by the bootstrap. It's just not how it works. Like, we cannot make ourselves more loving. Someone else has to step in and do it for us. There has to be someone else that teaches us and shows us. Like if I was to lay down right here and you were to walk by and you saw me like pulling on my belt and I'm just laying down here and I'm pulling on my belt and you walk by and you say, David, what are you doing? I say, well, I'm trying to pick myself up. 
And you say, well, David, you must not understand physics because you can't pick yourself up like that. (laughs) There needs to be a greater force beyond you to be able to lift you when you're down. God had to come and be the propitiation for us. He had to show us what love looks like. So, So this is great news for you and I because our ability to love God was never dependent on us. It was always dependent on us receiving Jesus to be love for us. Love begins with God, and it grows with our knowledge of him. That's point number two. It grows with our knowledge of him because we think, okay, now I'm going to him, and he's loving, and he's kind, and he's going to show me how to be loving. There's a great story in Luke chapter 15 I want us to look at. It's commonly referred to as the story of the prodigal son, and, and before we start, there's, there's two acts to this play. I kind of rushed it in first service, but we got, we got time, right? You guys were cold earlier. You can, you can defrost, and we can take our time through this story, right? Because as you're thinking about love, growing in love for God, right? That, that's the picture we're painting, and letting God love us. In the story of the prodigal son, there's two acts in this story. There's a younger son who is referred to as the prodigal because he runs away. He he runs away from God. And then there's a second act of the older brother who's always been at home, who's always strived to be righteous and do the right things, and both of them did not understand the love of God for them. Both of them needed to be taught more of who the Father is so they could grow in their love for God. The word prodigal doesn't mean what we often associate it with, which is wayward, living in sin. The word prodigal, the dictionary definition is wasteful or recklessly extravagant, giving or yielding profusely, very generous, very lavish. So when I describe that, I I wouldn't describe that as someone who is living in sin, even though you can be wasteful, even though you can be extravagant, even though you can be yielding, I think it talks about a prodigal love of how God gives away his love. I think in the story of the prodigal son, it's an example of God extravagantly, generously giving his love to the wayward son and to the son that's at home that doesn't understand. So so Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32, this is what the younger son does. He comes to the father, and in verse 11 it says, and he said, uh, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Okay, So I'll just kind of stop us right there and think through what that culturally means. The younger comes to the father and he asks for a share of his inheritance. Now this is uncommon and would never happen in that culture in the first century because you get your inheritance when the father dies. And the firstborn gets two-thirds of the inheritance, and the secondborn gets one-third of the inheritance. And so when the father passes away, they split away the property, and they get to go on with their life. So the younger son, to come to his father to say, give me the share of my inheritance, what he is saying to his father is, God, is, is, is I wish you were dead, and I don't longer want to live under your rule and control in my life, and I want to do my own thing, so give me what belongs to me, and I want to be on my way. That is oftentimes what we say to God when we say, God, I don't want to do what you've asked me to do in your scripture. God, I wish you were dead, and I want to live however I want to live with my life. I don't want to be under your rule, your authority, your reign. I don't believe what you say. Essentially, what we say to God is, God, I wish you were dead, and I don't want to be accountable. So in this culture and in this family, in this community, what would have happened is the son would have said something like that, and the father would have beat him to death, (laughs) right? Like it would have been murdered, right? Because what you're saying is so offensive that it won't go. But Jesus is telling this story to a group of religious Pharisees and Sadducees, and he's trying to teach them something about the love of God, that God's love is so extravagant, it's so reckless, it's so lavish, that it takes on offense. It takes on rejection that you could never imagine. And so this son takes his stuff and he goes on his way and the father has to experience rejected love. And oftentimes we do that to God because we don't have the capacity to love. 
We don't have the capacity to love him well. And so he goes, and he goes on his way. In verse 13, um, verse 13, in Luke chapter 15, verse 13, it says, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, and he took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So the younger son rebels, and he goes, and we've done this to God, and we've done this in our relationship with God so many times, and we do it so often, where we go into a far distant country, which is, could be, you can define it however you want, but it's your sin, it's your behavior, it's your lifestyle, where you say, you know what, I'm going to run as far from God that I can get to because I don't want him to see me in my mess, and, and I just want to hide from him, and, and I want to live how I want to live. I don't want to be under his rule and reign any longer, and therefore, I'm just going to go. And we've done this. We've all done this before to God where it's just like, I'm going to go try my own thing. I'm going to live my own way. And what happens oftentimes is it's never what it is cracked out to be. The expectation and the reality are so different, right? It's like whenever you see those social media reels where they're like, this is on Instagram and this is reality, right? (laughs) Like, Like this is what you think you're experiencing when you live in sin and you run from God's love. And this is the reality, And the reality that the younger son is experiencing here is he's like, man, once I've given it all away, there's nothing left to get back because the world will offer you love with emptiness. It will never have anything to give back to you. It will say, give me all you have, and I will give you back love. And it will take all you have, and it will give back to you emptiness. And that's what the younger son is experiencing. And he, and he comes to himself. Like, he lives how he wants to live. He squanders his, and, and he hits rock bottom. Like, I'm so thankful to God for seasons of rock bottom in my life. Like, that's when I realize he's the rock at the bottom that I've needed. Hitting rock bottom for you is God's greatest grace to you. Because in that moment, you realize the world has nothing for you. There is no love that can satisfy you there. It's just emptiness. And he comes to himself. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and I'll go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. So, so he comes to himself, and, and, and this is what I'm talking about, understanding the love of God and being loved. He comes to himself, and the realization he has is, is okay, uh, I, I need a better life. I, I, I don't want to deal with this any longer. And I don't, I, don't, I don't want to be in this situation, and I want to get better. And so he comes up with this apology that he's going to give to his dad. But his understanding of the love of God for him is, I can never go back to being a son, so I'm going to be a slave. So I'm going to go back to God, but I'm going to go back in shame. I'm going to go back with guilt. I'm going to go back with fear. And I'm going to go back having to earn everything I get from God again. And so Jesus is telling this story because he's saying, you, you, you have not been loved by God well because you don't understand the love of God. Because he comes with this idea that I'm just going to go to God and throw myself at the altar and be less than. And that is not how God loves us. Because the younger son gets home. And the Bible says that as he's a far way off, that his father sees him and he runs And he grabs him. And before he can even get out his confession, he begins to call his servants. And so go to verse 22. And he said, but his father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring a fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The father's response was, I'm going to run. 
I'm going to run to you. Like you take one step towards me, I'm going to run to you. That, that's the love of God. That's how God wants to love you. Like you make one attempt to know God, you, you just open your Bible, right? You just walk into the church, and here's God the Father who loves extravagantly saying, I'm going to run towards you, and I'm going to grab you, and I'm going to embrace you because that's how God love flows. It be, love begins with God, and it grows in God, and he will just run after you. And so the text says that the father is moved by his love for the son, but the culture tells us that he was moved by something else, and that is called cultural shame. You see, in this community, they could have voted the son out of the community. He could have returned back, and if the community had time to gather, they could have said, he is embarrassed the family, he's embarrassed the community, he's embarrassed our tribe, and we don't want him back. And so what does the father do? He runs, which would have exposed him, and fathers and elders don't run. And so he takes on the shame that the son is carrying as he's walking in, and he says, let me take the shame because I can handle it. He says, let me give you my best robe, and then let me give you shoes, and let me give you this ring, and let me give you the best quickly. Let's do this quickly before you're caught up in cultural shame for returning home. He says, they can shame me, but they can't shame you. You see, Jesus takes all our shame. The love of God, he just takes all our shame. That's who he is that once you start walking towards God, his response is, man, let me take your shame. I always talk about this for our churches. I, I want this to be um, a guilt-free, shame-free zone. Like, you should never be ashamed. Like, if they, I, I want people, like, I tell people this all the time, so if I said this to you, this is why. Because I never want you to feel like you can't come home. Because shame is a killer, and it kills the love of God for our life. And the enemy loves to shame you anytime you've walked away. But the love of God, what it says is come home. Like, let's throw a party. Let's celebrate. Like, let's, let's enjoy and rejoice because love flows from God. He says, I got it all, and I just, wanna, I just want you to be home to celebrate with you. But what shame does says is you can't come home. Guilt and shame says you, you don't belong home. Shame says you, you, they're not going to accept you like that. You're going to have to earn and work your way back to being right with God. And God is saying, no, just come home because I love you. And the only way you can love me well is to let me love you. And you can't let me love you in far distant country. You can't let me love you when you're running and living in shame. So he takes on the shame and he gives him the ring. He gives them the shoes, and he gives them the robe. This could be your story in the room right now, that you struggle to get here because of the shame you may be feeling, because there's things you've done in a far country in private that just getting to church was a struggle. Just opening your Bible is a struggle. And I want you to know that the love of God is so extravagant, it's so lavish, it's so overwhelming, like God cannot love you anymore. He loves you completely. This has been my story. A lot of my life was this story where I lived one way Monday through Saturday. And on Sunday, I showed up to church. And at some point, I just started wearing a mask so I didn't have to carry on the shame. And I couldn't be honest. But the whole time, I never let God love me. I just continued to wear masks. I just continued to pretend. I just continued to do things that was like, okay, I'll show up. But I never opened up deep enough to let God love me. And therefore, I never loved him well. The father says, look, we're having a party. And I want you to be there to celebrate. Now, there's another brother in this story. There's an older brother. And sometimes, we don't let God love us because we're in rebellion. And other times, we're like the older brother where we don't let God love us because we just feel like we're good enough. And, and so our whole life is spent striving and working. Our whole life is spent being good enough. And this could have been early adapted by being like the all-star kid at home and your parents raising you in a way that is very performative. And so you've just learned to get it right all the time. And therefore, you feel like, man, I'm, I've earned it. I belong here. And therefore, I don't let God love me because I oftentimes don't feel 
like I need to be loved. I feel like I'm good enough. And you won't grow in your love for God that way. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field, and as he came and he drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry, and he refused to go in. His father came out, and he entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you've never gave me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, who you killed the fatted calf for him, and he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and to be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. You see the attitude of the older brother. I've always been good. I've always been here. I've always served you. But you didn't love me. That's just not true. You see, when we're too good for our own good, (laughs) we think we're not being loved by God. And we think we're missing out on something because we're having to earn it. You feel like I've earned it. And therefore, what you're giving to God came from you. But it didn't. Love begins with God. And it grows with our knowledge of him. And it ends with God. Like sometimes we think we're giving God something he didn't give to us. (laughs) Like somehow I'm entreating him or I'm loving him or I'm doing something for him. No, everything we give back to God, he's already given to us. I can be kind because he was kind to me. I I have the Holy Spirit because he gave it to me. There's nothing we give back to God. And sometimes we get to the end of ourself as this older brother where we don't have any more capacity to love, where we've run on empty because we've given all we can. And oftentimes if you struggle with bitterness or unforgiveness or anger, you may have the older brother syndrome where you've had to earn your way. And so you cannot stand people that get a free ride. You cannot stand people that that get the grace and the favor because for you, you've earned it your whole life. And so you expect everyone to earn at the same level that you do. But the love of God doesn't work like that. God's love ends with him. And he supplies all those needs. And sometimes we have to realize, standing outside the party, where God is celebrating that he's calling us into. God is calling you, if you're an older brother in here, the invitation is also to you to come in. We don't know how this story ends. The curtains drop with the father and the son outside. But we know the same way the father went to the younger son, he went out for the older son. The same way he pleaded with the younger son to to come and celebrate and to be at home, the same way he pleaded with the older son to come in and to celebrate. Essentially what the father is saying is that this party is not complete unless both of my sons are in here. Both of them are enjoying and they're celebrating. But when we compare And when we compete and we feel like we've earned it, we miss out. I just started coaching my daughter's basketball team the last couple of weeks, and I signed up my son for basketball as well, and he's four, and they're not any good. So I was like, I'm not coaching you. (laughs) I can coach seven and eight-year-olds. I can work with them. And he was so upset because she was so excited. She was like, okay, dad's going to be my coach. And she was like, okay, first day we're going to go in there and I'm going to tell him you're the coach and I'm his, I'm his daughter. I'm Hannah. I'm, I'm his daughter and pass me the ball, right? That's all she wants. She wants people to pass her the ball. And we're driving home and so we had just signed up and, and Judah was just so upset. He was like, this is not fair. This is not fair that, that you get to coach her and I have to be coached by somebody else. And this is what came to my mind. I was studying the scripture, and I wanted to say this to Judah. I said, son, I'm always with you. I can always coach you. I'm always here. You just have to let me coach you. Because oftentimes when we're at home, we're just playing, right? We're not... So 
So sometimes when we feel like someone else is getting more love than we are, getting more grace than we are, getting more acceptance than we are, the father looks to older brothers and says, like, I'm always with you. You just got to let me love you. You got to let me love you. And the best thing that can happen is for us to get to a breaking point where we exhaust our ability to love. And we realize I'm not the source of this love. I need to go to the one who is love. And I need to let him love me. Because I cannot grow in my love for God and in my love for others if it's always dependent on how much I can give. For some of you that are married in the room, like you know at some point you cannot be Jesus to your spouse. They got to go to the source to be loved. Because if the expectation is the only love that I'm going to receive is from my spouse, they have to be, it has to flow from them. Eventually, they will run out, and you will get frustrated. And so we have to let God love us. Love begins with God, it grows with God, and it ends with God. In this story, and I'm, I'm getting ready to close, so the worship team, you guys, you guys can come up here. You know, Jesus just reveals the heart of God, and, and sometimes the light bulb has to go off for you and I. Uh, this, this, this had to happen to me for a while where you just get revelation of the love of God. And I was very performative when I first got saved. I was in a kind of a religious group that was really focused on achieving. And I love to achieve. I love to be number one. Like, I love to win. And so if you're like me, you're like, you want to get there. And so when you apply it to your faith, you're like, man, I just want to do everything right. Like, I, I want to I do it well. And so I became very religious. And so I would pray, and we'd have Bible studies, and we'd have prayer meetings that would go three, four hours a day. And I felt like I was really close to God. But then the way I treated other people, and the way that I looked down on other people, it, it, it didn't match. It didn't match. And I didn't realize that I had entered an older brother syndrome mode where I had earned my way to feeling like I was good enough for God, that I didn't need the grace of God, that I didn't need him to love me because I had earned it, through, I had earned it for myself. And God had to break me. God had to break me of that. And he brings you to the end of your capacity to love. And you start to look at someone else that you got to forgive, someone else that has done you dirty. You start to look at situations that don't go well. And you go to the scriptures where Jesus says, if a man sins against you, you got to forgive them. And the disciples ask, well, how many times am I going to forgive them? Like, seven times, 77. Like, man, you, you want me to forgive somebody? 77 times. Like, the, the, the number doesn't even add up. It's crazy. If they continue to sin against me, because... Jesus is expecting us not to be dependent on our love, but on his. And he will bring us to the breaking point where we have no more love to give. So God will love us. And so maybe that is where you're at. Maybe for you, you are in this place in your walk with the Lord where you are wayward and you just need the, the love of God to come in because you need to be loved and you need to be covered from shame and guilt and, and, and being far away and you feel like, okay, I, I, it was hard to even get here, but, but God is here because he wants to love you. He wants to love you well and we can't love God until we've been loved by God, but maybe we're on the other side of the spectrum where for you, you feel like you're good enough and you look at other people and you look down on them, I would say just as much you need to be loved by God. And we need to put down the mask and to get rid of the facade and just say, Lord, I just want you to love on me. So this response time as we pray, if you just need to be loved by God, the altar is open and we'll just pray together. And you just find your way up here because maybe you just need to experience love that is extravagant, that is lavish, that is beyond what you can imagine because God is love. He is the source. He is the antithesis of that. And maybe you've experienced a counterfeit or fake love in your life and so you're just, you're just like, I just don't trust it. Well, the Lord will meet you where you're at. So I'm going to ask us to stand. I'm going to pray for you, and we're just going to worship the Lord. If you're new to Anchor here, we do response every Sunday where we pray together. We do the Lord's communion together. And so if, if, you, if you are a follower of Jesus and you love the Lord, man, feel free to grab communion after the, the song is done or any time in between. And uh, the altar is open for anyone that needs prayer. Lord Jesus, we, we love you and we thank you for 
just your love in our life, would you overwhelm us this morning with your presence, with how much you love us. I pray for those that, that maybe came in here carrying a level of shame and guilt and frustration, not being able to figure it out and not be able to get it right. And, and Lord, you, you're meeting them here in this very moment right now. And I pray that you would give them the courage to respond and, and they would let you love them. They would let you. They would give you access to love them. Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. He says, anyone who opens the door, I'll come in and dine with you. God wants to have relationship with you and to be close to you. And if you're in here today, the love of God is going to meet you at the altar. If you've been walking with God and you're struggling, you've come to the end of yourself, you don't have no more capacity to, to give any more love away and you're on empty, the love of God will meet you here overwhelm you, to fill up your cup, because love begins with God. We love you, we thank you.